Thank you, Michael. We will have a Q&A session after Heather, so Michael will stay with us. And Heather Boucher will talk, yeah, have a seat up there. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, Heather, I have to tell you, I, uh, I read uh, your book over the holiday, um, and I uh, read segments of it aloud to my wife and my daughter, and it generated one overwhelming emotion, and that was anger. Anger at the picture you paint of what we've hap let happen in this country. So we want you to talk about it more here, and then I'll have a chance to ask you some questions about it uh, uh, during that session. So Heather? Thank you. Um, thank you, Bill. Um, anger is, uh, that's, that's both good and, um, yeah, I was going to try to be a little upbeat after Michael, but now, now, you know what, I don't know what to say. Um, so it is just really, uh, quite a treat to be able to be here. Um, I'm a, uh, I feel longstanding that I, I have been a longstanding member of NASI, although I don't, I'm not sure exactly how long it's been now. Um, but very proud, um, to be a part of this institution and I'm very excited. I'm on the economic security study panel. Um, and I thought that the care, um, giving report was just fantastic. I, I actually cited in the book and I've talked about it to a lot of people. Um, and um, I think Michael's was just a wonderful, um, this is, a, I think, a really hopefully rich conversation we're having here today, a great um, setup for what I'm going to talk about. And um, so with that, uh, let me just sort of um, get right into it. And I'm going to put my watch up to make sure that I'm tracking the time as well. Um, so uh, I um, am the co-founder of the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. We launched in November of 2013. And our goal is to advance evidence-backed ideas and policies in promote of growth that is strong, stable, and broadly shared. And um, we, uh, this book is really the culmination of what I and my team have learned over the past six years since we launched this organization. We have a very unique institutional strategy in that we fund scholars um, affiliated with academic institutions from all over the country to investigate questions of whether and how economic inequality in all its forms affects our economy and our society. And so what I talk about in the book, I elevate a number of scholars um, in our community um, whose work is emblematic of what the cutting edge research in economics is finding. And so for those of you who are both lawyers and non-economists as well as hopefully the economists, um, you know, part of what we're trying to do is to take the research um, that's been happening in economics about what's good for the economy and bring that into our policymaking conversation. Um, one of the things that I argue in the book is that there has been a paradigm shift happening inside of economics, in no small part driven by new methods, new ways of showing causality, really a focus on identification and all the different kinds of studies that people do now, um, nat you know, natural experiments and um, all, the, all the other things as well as access to data that was just unimaginable 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, and of course, the combination with computing power. I mean, we carry around computers in our phones now that you know uh, were just impossible to think of even when I was in graduate school and had to go to a computer center to do my dissertation work. But all of this is leading to scholars who are asking new questions that, as Thomas Kuhn would say, they're finding anomalies in this field of inquiry that are inconsistent with some of the commonly held assumptions about how the economy works. And um, I, I, I both argue that, um, that we are in the midst of a paradigm shift in terms of economics and that we need to bring this new understanding into our, under, our, our broader national understanding about what is good for the economy and what it means. And um, so I'm just going to, so in my 20 minutes here, I'm going to show you a couple of slides to, to sort of ground the conversation in terms of inequality. I'm going to get to the conclusions of the book. Um, and I'm going to talk for just a couple of minutes about what we can do about the challenges that I, that I talk about. But before I get to that, I just want to get straight to the point and sort of give the spoiler alert um, that, that what, I, what we find, this new research and evidence from economics shows, is that inequality systemically obstructs subverts and distorts the pathways to economic um, productivity and growth. And that, um, you know, as we're thinking about what this means, there, there, there are a couple points I want to make. One is that as I look at this, this paradigm shift really does feel like, you know, as we're thinking about, um, for example, climate change, which is this shift in, in how our environment looks that means we need to reevaluate our daily actions and how we're thinking about life around us. 
This shift in economic inequality is just as potent and just as deep and just as important. So as Michael was talking about, um, you know, that we should pursue proximate goals as one of your, your six points on your slide up there about um, the, um, the effective distribu distributive legislative um, politics. As you were talking, I was thinking, well, how is it that high concentrated inequality changes that conclusion? Does it or doesn't it? That is a question that we need to be asking because the economic environment in which we are working in, in which we are thinking about how our economy works, is fundamentally and profoundly shifted. And with that, our thinking about the common sense understandings and what we know has to change as well. And so the second point, the second conclusion from the book alongside that is that our economy only works it as advertised if there are, are institutions that constrain inequality at the top and provide a counterweight to the economic um, and social and political power that concentrated economic, um, uh, economic concentration brings. And by a counterweight, I mean both not just economics, so you can think of unions, but also civil society, social and political, because with this concentration, you have this massive imbalance in our economy, but also that feeds into our whole society. So that's the, um, that's the conclusion. So I'm not rushing at the end to tell you it, although I will repeat some of those points. Um, let me just give you a couple of data points to just ground really the question. Um, and I know all of you are experts here, and so you know, as I'm, um, my book came out in October, so I've been doing a lot of talking to different audiences around books. And so you know, you change the slides up each time, um, but hopefully this will at least be a, um, uh, illustrative of, of why this is such a pressing problem. So um, this is a slide from data from Thomas Piketty, Emmanuel Saez, Gabriel Zuckman, um, looking at um, the x-axis is the income distribution from low income to high income. The y-axis is national income growth, which is essentially akin to GDP. You take out um, uh, a couple of things, but uh, it's essentially akin for the purposes of this conversation. And the purple line across the, um, uh, going across the horizontal is average national income growth between 1963 and 79. And it is this kind of chart, this kind of data, that led, you know, in 1963, um, John F. Kennedy to say, a rising tide lifts all boats. Because what this shows you is that as the economy is growing, the vast majority of Americans are seeing their growth, their income grow at about the average. Rich people are seeing their incomes grow slower than the average. And poor people, low-income people, are seeing their incomes grow faster than the average. That's not to say that the low-income folks have caught up or there's no poverty, but, uh, but year after year, we were a nation that was growing together. Inequality was contracting, um, and, uh, and average economic growth meant something. There are a number of significant changes. This is just income, uh, but there's been a number of significant changes since 1980 in these trends, but in a bunch of other trends. So let me just go through these, and I'll go through the others um, briefly. So first, and we don't talk about this enough, Average national income growth has slowed since 1980. So it used to be about 1.7% year. Now it's about 1.3%. That as a fact to ground our conversations about what's working in the economy, how we think about economic policy and its successes, is a question that we need to be asking ourselves. What have we been doing differently since the early 1980s that might lead to slower growth? Or is it just the result of things forces beyond our control? The second two data points are embodied in this chart. So this is looking from 1980 to 2016. Same information, x-axis is income distribution, y-axis is income growth um, annualized. And as you can see, we are now a nation that is not growing together, where the top are taking home um, significant income gains much faster than the rest of the income distribution. And then we're also a nation where the aggregate story, the average, doesn't tell the story of what's happening all across these United States. And so I think, Michael, your, con your, your conversation about um, how economic insecurity plays its, uh, its way through our politics and our society, you know, I often hear policymakers say, well, GDP is going great, or the unemployment rate is low. What's the problem, right? And then I think of a figure like this, where for 40 years, We've been growing apart, and bottom 90% of the income distribution has seen their incomes not grow on average with the nation as a whole. So what that means is that when you hear the latest GDP numbers, the Bureau of Economic Analysis person gets on television you know, this quarter and says, hey, growth was 3% in the last quarter. 
Um, if it was 1978 or 1969, you know, that meant that most people were seeing their incomes grow by three, did I say three and a half percent? Three percent, whatever. Keep making, changing the number, three percent. Um, but today when you hear that number, and you say, oh, the, the GDP grew by 3%, what you should be thinking is the rich people in the United States got, saw their incomes grow by, I don't know, 6 or 9% or something a lot more than 3 and everybody else saw their incomes grow by something less, but I don't really know what that is. Um, and so our, our stories that we're telling about economic progress aren't, are no longer consistent with the evidence. But um, it's not just that we've been seeing this rise in these trends in inequality and income. Of course, we've been seeing them in wealth, We've been seeing it across um, firms as rising economic concentration. So this plays out across our economy, not just terms of income, but these other economic indicators as well. So as we have been looking at the empirical research, um, and in the chapters of the book, there are sort of six chapters broken into three um, sections. I'll give you the highlights from the three sections. Um, in each chapter, I focus on a scholar whose research is emblematic of what we are learning from the latest research and evidence about how uh, various aspects of inequality affect the economy. The first conclusion is that inequality systemically obstructs the supply of people and ideas into the economy, limits opportunity for those not already, already at the top, and that slows productivity and growth. And let me just give you one um, uh, data point that I think is very evocative of this finding. So um, in the early part of equitable growth, we funded, um, uh, helped fund a project by Raz Chetty and his colleagues where he wanted to understand um, the, 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 the relationship between inequality and innovation. So he said, okay, I want to look at people who have patents. So there's all this data on everybody who applied for and received a patent and was able to connect that to data on people's third grade test scores in math and, under, and other things and their demographics and their family income. And of course, I'm sure many of you have heard of this study, but they found that children that do really good on those third grade math test scores much more likely to grow up and become an innovator. Okay, common sense. But then if you just look at the kids that did really good on that third grade math test score, you find that those who, from higher in, high income families are four times as likely to grow up and become an innovator as those from the rest of the income distribution. And of course, white children much more likely to grow up and become an innovator relative to, to black children and Latino children. And of course, little boys more likely to grow up and become an innovator than little girls, all in that high scoring group. And of course, they call this paper, um, oh, well, well, is this just, it's, oh no, sorry, sorry, this is very confusing. Um, they call this paper the lost Einsteins because of the lost productivity that inequality is causing in our economy. And so that's just one way. Um, of course, I talk about a lot of different other ways that inequality obstructs. The second is that inequality subverts the institutions that manage the market, uh, making our political system ineffective and our markets dysfunctional. So I won't focus on the political because I think Michael's um, talked about a lot of those issues. But what we are seeing increasingly is that the high um, and growing concentration across firms in our economy is leading to the capacity of some firms um, to control what their market looks like. So they're able to essentially rig the game. They're both the, the players and the referees, right? They're both the people who are setting out the ground rules for what's going to happen in their sector, and they're also being able to benefit from those rules. Um, that's a subversion of the way markets work, right? And all of that is completely inconsistent with a simplistic Econ 101, uh, perfectly competitive markets. And of course, any economist will tell you, well, that doesn't actually apply in most markets, and we really study imperfect competition. And economists will tell you that. But our rules of thumb for, you know, all you lawyers in the house and the non-economists and the people that aren't sort of thinking about all of the different um, assumptions that go into how we think about the economy, the need to unpack that and say, with rising economic inequality, the market doesn't work as advertised, and that needs to change our, our common sense understanding of what makes the economy work. Because inequality um, is subverting these institutions, both in terms of practice and, of course, in terms of our politics. The next way that inequality constricts growth is through distorting our macroeconomy, through effects on both consumption and investment. And um, I think the effects of, on consumption, especially I'm sure for you all, are fairly straightforward. If you have a rising economic inequality like I showed you in that chart, and you've got some people with increasing money and some people who are seeing their incomes fall, it seems sort of 
obvious and very Keynesian that the people at the bottom don't have as much to spend, and that's going to affect our, our, the, the cycle of the economy. Where economists have been doing interest, very interesting new research is on the effects on investment. So there's compelling new evidence that actually rising concentration across firms is one of the main culprits behind the decline, the sort of the secular decline in investment in the United States relative to profitability. So rising concentration across firms is actually uh, means that, that firms don't have as many competitors. They don't have that incentive to invest, but that's having this economy-wide measurable effect. We also know that as we've seen wealth inequality rise, you've got a lot of folks that have a lot of money. And um, a con and sort of a simplistic model will say, oh, well, that means there's going to be more invest investment just sort of automatically, because that's going to be that's going to translate itself through the equities market into investment. Um, in the sixth chapter of the book, I focus on work by Atif Mian and Amir Sufi. And I interviewed um, each of the economists for the book. So I interviewed Atif and I've talked to him a number of times. And he is just has been doing so much research and just presented new papers at the ASSA meetings um, last weekend showing how the, the savings glut that we have in our economy is actually directly connected to the rise in wealth inequality and that those extra funds are being pushed out to households in the form of increasing credit supply, not into increasing investment, which is a massive distortion and makes families less financially insecure ultimately. So um, in the book I talk about, in each chapter I talk about the policy recommendations, what we should do about it, um, I focus on how if we want to do the things that really improve the lives of people and families, if we want to do things like um, all the good things that we talk about here and invest in early childhood and social insurance and all of the and infrastructure and all the things, um, that's important and that can help us deal with the obstructions that inequality causes. But if we really want to get at the crux of the problem, we have to deal with the subversive aspects of highly concentrated economic resources. We need to rethink um, reimagine how we um, execute on our antitrust uh, legislation that we have and, w and expand that. Um, a lot of it is just going back to the way that we used to enforce antitrust, um, although there is some legislative fixes that we need. Um, we also need to think about how we're going to raise revenue, right? We know that revenue as a share of GDP is now at um, you know, lows that we haven't seen in generations. Um, and, we, and we bring in less revenue um, relative to GP, GDP than many of our, econ than our economic competitors. And that's going to require us, um, we need to tax more, to be quite frank. Um, and we should be thinking about how we tax at the top, because those at the top have been benefiting the most from our economy. This inequality is distortionary, so there's reasons to tax at the top. And there's a lot of new tax research that shows that that's also an economic good. Those are all big things, incredibly difficult to do. And I want to end on a very positive, not anger-filled, optimistic note about um, one thing that, uh, that we can do that um, is actually now, I'm very excited to say, uh, was uh, just in the legislation that passed at the end of the year in the Defense um, Reauthorization Act, a million dollars was given to the Bureau of Economic Analysis to start working on a pilot for what I'm going to show you. Um, and uh, they have put on their website their, their first um, attempts at this are going to go up in March. So very exciting. But what we have been talking about equitable growth is that this is a picture of national income, uh, the years from 1963 to, it's, I think it's actually, yeah, it's a 1967 to 2000 something. It's not so much the years that matter, but this is sort of, this is akin to GDP. Again, it's national income year over year over time. And this is the way we get the data typically from the, from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. You just get this aggregate number and then, you know, every quarter and then of course the numbers are revised five times. So there's all of these press hits. Each time they're revised, the press report on here's what GDP is doing. This is what it means for our economy. Um, and what we have been working with economists to do, um, and then to get the government to actually implement on, is to change this. So instead of releasing these aggregate numbers, we release these disaggregated numbers, where we show the American people, we connect the dots for them between growth and distribution in one data release, so that the, these gold bars at the top is where it's a, a uh, that's where all the gold, all the money goes to, you know, the, the people in the gold, the gold-plated people. That's the richest 0.1% of Americans. And then the blue is the poorest 50%. And you can see that the share of national income going to the top, you can see visually what proportion of those gains year over, those changes year over year in national income, who it's going to. And you can see that there are some years, um, so I can't, I, uh, 
So I think the year, yeah, so, um, you know, some of these years when, um, uh, that at the top, I can't, I think it's 2009, where um, the, the share that the top 1% lost was, um, uh, they lost income while everyone else, you know, saw slight income gain. So the average is small. So there are years where the, the top have not done so well. But overall, this chart is mostly gold. It's not mostly blue, which is what it should be, because if it, if it reflected an equitable distribution by any shape or form, the bl bottom blue should be receiving half of the, of the national income gains month after month. So um, uh, I'm glad that my book made you angry, because there's a lot to be mad about. Um, we've allowed inequality to increase unfettered for uh, a very long time, and it has these um, negative effects on our economy and our society. But I do think that there's a lot of things that we can do, and I'm very happy to be here because I think connecting the dots between the work that we do that is directly about people and how we think about our stories about what is good for the economy is core to where we need to change the economic narrative over the next 40 years, and I'm very happy to be able to talk to you all about this today. Thank you.